you know, targets to the, uh, you know, bank and the management, the leader, the CMD or the CEO, they come out with so much of targets and all that. But who is to actually do it? It is down the line, the poor manager who is struggling to face all this simultaneously. You know, it is not one target you achieve that. No, there are so many things given to him together. So there, you know, the team has to work with him. And how does he get the team? There is where the HR comes in. You recruit the right person, you train the right person, you put them at the right place, but it doesn't end there. There is a question of, you know, aptitude for that work, motivating them to do it properly also. There again, the role of HR is very, very serious. And, you know, it is, uh, if you go through many of the banks, their recruitment policy now, you'll find that the, uh, you know, the manager level, uh, their average age level is round about above 50. And the new recruit who comes in is 23, 22. The, uh, the you know, the gap, the uh, uh, age gap, the generation gap is very huge. As uh, Sir said, uh, uh, you know, Making them understand that this is what to be done, it is very difficult. And they come out with new and varied ideas that, you know, <laughs> you are able, unable to satisfy them. Their job satisfaction. You know, they, uh, most of the persons who join banking now, even at the clerical post, are highly qualified people. All BTECs, MBAs, MCA, and uh, they, they will be able to finish their routine work in no time. So they are underutilized there and, uh, you know, they, their job satisfaction is at stake. There is a lot of attrition also. Many of them leave the bank fold because they are not getting total satisfaction. That is where HR comes in. We try to bring in some, you know, fast track uh, promotions so that they get motivated to work at a higher level. Their status remains improved and, uh, you know, they get some kind of motivation to continue with the bank also. So, retention of these staff with us, after all this training, after all this, uh, you know, equipping them for the new role, if they leave your fold, the bank st stands to lose monetarily also. So, you know, filling this gap is a problem, making them understand the requirement is a problem, and at the same time, getting performance to reach the Big, hairy, audacious goals. So all this put together, banking industry itself is going through a very, very difficult period. And I feel this connection between HR and uh, corporate governance with a proper leader giving the right direction is a must in the banking industry. Uh, as I have been in the banking industry for the past 32 years, I'm not able to tell much about the, you know, the connectivity between these two in other industries, but we are facing the problem immensely. And unless the banking, uh, I mean, the bank comes up, rises up to this uh, requirement, it is going to be a very, very difficult situation in future. And uh, <coughs> succession planning, this is one uh, very important thing. See, in uh, my bank, for example, by 2018, Almost 85% of the experienced higher level top management are leaving the bank. So which means we are leaving the bank in the hands of very young, inexperienced people uh, to handle, uh, you know, uh, aspects of banking which are very, very intricate. The bank is running a terrible risk. So this succession planning assumes, uh, you know, great importance here. We are to identify people suited for specific roles and train them up quickly so that they can fill this gap. There again, we are finding it very, very difficult because there are a lot of restrictions for recruiting the right person. We cannot have our own choice of going for campus selection. We have to go. That is where your, you know, transparency and all that comes in, where you are to advertise, make it known that you're going to take uh, people into the bank, what their qualification requirements are. You are not given the freedom to go on uh, campus selection so that you can uh, recruit the right person for the right job. So it becomes, you know, recruiting from the general pool and then trying to bring them into the right uh, 
uh, aptitude to take up the right job. There again you run into great difficulty. So uh, what I feel is each of uh, the you know, banks, I mean from the banking industry, unless we pay serious attention to the role or the connectivity between HR and corporate governance, we are in for trouble. So let us identify the seriousness of it right away and try to bring in, uh, you know, uh, changes immediately or at least at the earliest so as to solve our problem and stay ahead in the banking industry. Thank you very much. Beautifully put, Indrani. Beautifully put. Mark these words. If we do not establish the contact between HR and good corporate governance, we are in serious trouble. Not my words. The experience speaks here. The experienced professional that Indira is. What has she identified? Very clearly, bad corporate governance in the first place has created what is now being identified as an attrition gap. The banking industry is suddenly without a succession plan. Year after year after year, practically no recruitment. Why? Why does a crisis hit you in the face when actually you can see it a mile away? Why do very often the deer which sees the tiger in front, instead of running, actually freezes. Does nothing when it actually should be running. And the banking industry is, I think, similarly positioned. It looked at the crisis and stared at it, but did nothing. And today, we are actually having seen the way that banking failures across the globe have created in a financial crisis bringing the entire world to its knees are primarily banking failures, toxic credit. The invention of new finance derivatives about which the boards of companies were either unaware or were illiterate so as not to be able to follow them because they were so complex. That really brings us to the issue of how bad corporate governance can get. And what, according to Indira, is the solution? One, when you develop this good leadership, they are the ones who govern. But even more importantly, who is governed? The employee. Are we governing them well? And if we are, are they therefore performing well? If they are not, the whole governance system itself is becoming toxic. Forget about the finance part. Toxic corporate governance to me is the major danger today. Actually some kind of an acidic effect that it's having on companies. So thank you Indraji for giving us a, I think a very, very uh, clear and a very focused uh, look at the way that HR and corporate governance are connected. And then we move on to our final speaker, Dhruv Yota. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, some very interesting stories, anecdotes and quotes about the relationship between HR and corporate governance. Uh, long time ago, I personally moved from a marketing background into the HR arena per se. Uh, the main core reason for me was I wanted to kind of get out of the so-called rat race to try and become the CEO of the organization. But the quote that, uh, or the anecdote that sticked with me, Dr. Chatterjee said, that HR is now also being considered as the watchdog of looking at the corporate governance. So I think as HR professionals, we all have to remain as an animal in one way or the other, jokes apart. Uh, but it is, it is a very, imp uh, you know, important area to look at. As an HR professional, Dr. Chatterjee, we never look at ourselves as responsible for corporate governance. We typically tend to look at ourselves as people who are responsible for organization culture, values, and principles. And one of the key inputs 
to corporate governance would be values and the cultures of organization. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I represent an organization which is in the broking sphere. Banking, financial services, insurance and stock broking are considered one of the fastest growing industries in the Indian context per se. But one of the examples, uh, value-based items that I would like to share with all is that in the private sector BFSI, when we look for people, one of the values that we look for and the competency that we care for is what is called as achievement orientation. Are these people risk takers? Are they having high aspirations? And if you look at certain studies that has been done in this area, typically high aspirations, high risk takers also tend to bend rules, bend the norms. And when you get used to bending the rules and the norms, one of the byproduct is sometimes to even break the rules. And that is when, when the management, the leadership, as most of the speakers have spoken about, do not take a stance. The small bending of the rules, those minor breakage in the rules, tend to get cascaded and it can even grow into something which is uncontrollable. Which is what Dr. Chatterjee also alluded to when he spoke about the credit derivatives which resulted in the 2008 meltdown in the global uh, arena per se. Now, after the shit has hit the fan, there is nothing really that can be done about it. Pardon my language here, but over the last five years, the global economy has been going through a cleaner process. And today too, in the Indian context, what is the most important thing that companies are looking for? Performance and productivity. Stable growth is not good enough for anyone. Even in the private sector, for example, in my organization, the only variable that contributes to our industry's performance is people. So if the HR is able to hire people on time, not select here, hire people on time, the organization's productivity and performance will be larger. Because in the financial services domain, products are common across all companies. It is just the differentiation in talent that may change from one company to another. So if you're able to hire people faster, you will be more productive. If you're able to train people better, your performance would be better. But at the same time, the culture in most organizations is slowly moving in a direction which can be considered as dysfunctional. Why is that? Because if you have to choose between values and performance, what typically gets chosen first? Performance. Always. Nine out of ten times, if not ten out of ten times, you will always choose an employee who is a top performer and leave certain misgiving about his values and principles. And that is not necessarily in a certain pocket. It has also become part of a general culture. Now, how many of you gentlemen drive? or ride a bike or a car. Raise your hands, please. Yeah. So typically, if you're driving in the night at about 11, 30, 12, okay, and if there is a signal in the night, in all honesty, how many of you guys at a red signal would stop when there is no traffic in the night? Fewer hands than before? Now, this is not because of the personal values of individual. This is because all around it is accepted. And in a similar manner, in organizations where HR professionals such as us are working and when we look at the performers and the strong value drivers being separated as chalk and cheese and more emphasis given on the performer who may not necessarily stick to certain values and principles getting the growth and promotion, we also tend to stop looking at those aspects as strong as we need to. So with Dr. Chatterjee's opening remarks, it is actually an awakening call for us to look at ourselves as also the corporate governance watchdog or beholders of this trade. It is very important. It is important that at every opportunity, we look at these differentiations that are being carried out due to values and performance and put our foot down. Make aware of the management that the choice that they are making could have a long-term effect. 